sources via tweet. He tweeted this. The four-page memo released Friday reports the disturbing fact about how the FBI and FISA appear to have been used to influence the 2016 election and its aftermath. The FBI failed to inform the FISA court that the Clinton campaign had funded the dossier. The FBI became a tool of anti-Trump political actors. This is unacceptable in a democracy and ought to alarm anyone who wants the FBI to be a nonpartisan enforcer of the law. The FBI wasn't straight with Congress as it hid most of these facts from investigators and he cites the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, and what's interesting is that this is just phase one, right? Devin Nunes did an exclusive interview with her own Brett Baer on Friday on Special Report uh, and said, look, this memo, everyone thought this is it. Okay, is right. it a dud? Is it... He said, this is part one. State Department is next. You heard Jason Chaffetz earlier on the show saying they'll be digging into the intelligence community, which is all riled up and, and claimed that this was going to damage national security. Then the memo comes out. There does not appear, at least, to be any damage to national security. So Devin Nunes is going to keep pushing. And he's the person who we wouldn't know anything about Fusion GPS. Really, he who, is the and, and the Hillary Clinton campaign paying for the dossier without him demanding those bank records. That's right. He is the unsung hero. He has had to fight tooth and nail against members of Congress who should care about transparency and ethics in the FBI and DOJ. After all, they have oversight over those um, agencies. Uh, really pushing back against that, uh, we wouldn't know at all that the dossier was paid for by the DNC. More coming from Nunes, but also more coming from the Department of Justice Inspector General. The IG, uh, that's Who's right. putting out this report, and a little earlier, Jason Chaffetz laid it all out. Donald Trump didn't create this mess, but he is here to help clean it up. Anybody who reads that memo will understand that the, what the uh, lawmakers are highlighting here is potential abuses in our system. Uh, and and there, you know, all the flailing that I heard from Adam Schiff and all these Democrats that this was an attack on law, uh, attack on law enforcement. This was going to dismantle our security apparatus. This was going to reveal sources and methods. None of that is true. Uh, None yeah. of it. And bottom line is that report from the inspector general. Some said it might be months away. I've been hearing in Washington it could be weeks away. So right. more is coming. And if you woke up this morning and decide you're going to read papers or you're watching anybody else in the mainstream media, a completely different view of the world. The view being put out there is Donald Trump is going to attack our FBI and our law enforcement. Let's take a look at some headlines. This is from the New York Times, or as Pete likes to say, the failing New York Times. Trump's unparalleled war on a pillar of society, law enforcement. This one comes from Politico. Trump escalates his war with U.S. law enforcement after memo release. Washington Post, once the party of law and order, Republicans are now challenging it. And so you can hear the three of us talk about this and give our opinions on it. I've told you what mine is. I go to these diners. I talk to people, including law enforcement. They love this president. But Ed and I had the good fortune to sit down with an FBI agent. We asked him directly, what do you think? And he had a surprise. Yes. He went after James Comey and said the leadership is the problem. But he had a little surprise about Andrew McCabe. Watch. Those of us that are in the retired agent community were hearing that Director, uh, Deputy Director McCabe was expressing his opinions in closed door meetings all the time about, about Trump. So we're, we're talking about a predetermined investigation. And that, and that is just not how the FBI as a whole operates. The problem is agents on the street don't operate that way. Ah, interesting. Andrew McCabe ousted this past week right. as a deputy mm -hmm. director. His wife in 2015 was running for the state Senate in Virginia with money from Terry McAuliffe, buddy of the Clintons. That, that has been aired. He waited till the very last minute to recuse himself in the Hillary Clinton investigation, was overseeing it, even though his wife had gotten money from McAuliffe's pack. Okay, fast forward the text messages, Strzok and Page. The insurance policy was about out. If Donald Trump gets elected, there's a meeting in Andy's office. We believe that to be Andrew McCabe. And now we're hearing from this former FBI agent, this retired right. FBI agent, that in fact McCabe, he's hearing, was was out there in private meetings giving his opinion, saying he didn't like Donald Trump. Right. What in the world was going on? It's interesting. You said that the Democrats said the Republican Party used to be the party of law and order. Uh, the Democrat used to be the party of JFK. I think what we're seeing right now is this is officially the party of Bernie Sanders. Socialists uh, don't care about individual rights. All the individual rights that have been violated through the unmasking, through the spying, on um, the lack of transparency in these in, in the upper echelons of these uh, departments. This is a uh, a party, a socialist party, who cares about the state, the collective, not individual rights. And that's why, if you're wondering why Democrats and the media, which is one and the same, are not concerned about all this, that's your answer, in my opinion. Mm. All right, we've got a lot of other headlines this morning. Uh, turning now to your headlines. Terrifying moments.
caught on camera when a police officer is run over by a carjacking mm -hmm. suspect while making an arrest. Police storming the vehicle before the driver backs over the two. The suspect flees, running them over again. A plainclothes officer had a gun drawn on the suspects but did not fire. Policy prohibits San Francisco police from shooting at cars. Their union says it puts officers' lives in danger. The suspects were arrested. The officer is expected to be okay. Christian Broadcasting Network founder Pat Robertson recovering after suffering from a stroke. A family member rushing the 87-year-old tele televangelist to a hospital in Virginia after recognizing symptoms. Robertson hosts CBN's flagship show, The 700 Club, where he interviewed President Trump during his campaign and after the election. He is expected to make a full recovery. President Trump and the First Lady are hosting a Super Bowl party. Wow, I wish I was invited. <laughs> At mar a the First Family will hold the festivities before traveling back to Washington. The President has a friendly relationship with the mm. New England Patriots, especially owner Robert Kraft and quarterback Tom Brady. And speaking of the big game, our own Pete Hagsent live in his home state of Minnesota there for Super Bowl 52. Pete, you still look cold. It looks, doesn't look like it's warmed up that much. <laughs> Holy Cow, it's only getting colder. It's <laughs> negative 22 Ooh. is what it feels like right now. So I can barely feel my face, but we'll we'll go with it. Hey, we're outside the stadium where it'll be rocking tonight when the Philadelphia Eagles take on New England Patriots, but there's no way to sugarcoat that this has been a difficult year for the NFL. Right. The mm -hmm. kneeling controversy, the anthem controversy, uh, and we've seen the ratings drop significantly. There's actually a Wall Street Journal uh, NBC News poll that came out just yesterday that said that viewership is down this year. Uh, substantially from two, three, four years ago. So I went to the Mall of America, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump from here yesterday to talk to fans of the NFL and say, hey, are, does did the kneeling controversy affect you? Are you watching more? Are you watching less? This is what the fans had to say about the NFL this year. I watched just as much as I did before. So none of the controversies around the NFL, the anthem protests and things like that have affected you? No, not to me at all. Actually, I, uh, I respect their decision. We wish they'd stand up. We love our country. We want them to do it. Stand up. They make millions of dollars in this country. They couldn't go anywhere else and do it. So stand up and honor our flag. I was in the service for 23 years. Yeah, that very that, that affects me uh, personally. Uh, sometimes I got to shut the game off. I can't even watch it anymore. You know, guys, mm. uh, bottom line, fans want politics out of sports. A lot of people said, hey, I still watch, but I watch reluctantly. But the ratings reflect there's plenty of people that have turned off the dial. Uh, no doubt the NFL in this offseason is going to have to address what they do with patriotism and the anthem because viewership is down substantially. We'll see what it is today. Well, that, maybe that's to what they're doing with all the veterans that they're having. We are in the middle of what I call phase two of our investigation, which involves other departments, uh, specifically the State Department and some of the involvement that they had in this. Uh, that investigation is ongoing, uh, and we continue to work towards uh, finding answers uh, and, and asking uh, the right questions to try to get to the bottom uh, of what exactly the State Department uh, was up to in terms of this Russia investigation. Well, Fox News contributor and investigative journalist Sarah Carter has been covering this story from the beginning. You know that. She joins us now to weigh in live. Good to see you, Sarah. And I wonder whether or not you can tee any of that up, because I remember a couple of days before the Nunes memo was released on Friday, John Kerry, the former head of the State Department under President Obama, was out there aggressively saying this is going to endanger national security. This Nunes memo cannot come out. Was his view shaded a little bit by maybe what he and his department did with the dossier? I think you're right on the mark there, Ed. Uh, look, they came out not just not just Kerry, but we saw for, you know Eric Holder. Mm -hmm. We saw many other members of the uh, Obama administration come out and say this is going to destroy national security. We don't want this out. Uh, Director Comey was another one, former FBI Director Comey. And what we discovered was there was nothing in there. And I've spoken to a number of U.S. intelligence sources about this. There was nothing in that memo at all that would have damaged national security of the United States or the processes by which they gather the FISA warrants, right, or the applications. So now we have to ask ourselves why. And I believe you're right. This is due to the second memo that the House Intelligence Committee is putting together. And remember, we're still waiting for the inspector general's report yeah. that's going to be coming out that's going to be directed at Andrew McCabe, 
deputy, you know, now former deputy director, yeah. Andrew McCabe, and others. And I think that they're terrified of what's going to come out here because this is what we know. There was a second dossier that was put together by a person named Cody Shear. Mm. He's a very controversial activist, a former uh, reporter who worked with the Clintons in the past. And the FBI was also using this second dossier as part of what they were doing to back up the other dossier, the Christopher Steele unverified dossier. Another wow. thing that's important is we believe, and I've been talking to sources, that Christopher Steele was also sending information to the State Department in bits and snippets. But I think the most important thing here, and one of the things that they're going to be looking at very closely are the leaks. Yeah. There were a number of leaks out of unverified information by possibly senior members of the Obama administration. Wow. Well, I want now, to bring Rachel in as well, and I hate to interrupt you, oh, but okay. you said something oh, no. about a second dossier, and I've heard rumblings of that, but I'm not sure our viewers have heard too much about it. So briefly, so we can get Rachel in here as well, is this a second anti-Trump dossier? What do we know? Okay, this is what we know here. There is a second anti-Trump dossier that that I have been able to confirm. That was written by Cody Shear. Now he is not an expert in espionage. He has no background in intelligence. He is a former reporter and a political activist. He also had a close relationship with Cindy Blumenthal. And remember, I mm. talked about that on the show before. I wrote a piece about it, how Cindy Blumenthal would be connected to the dossier in one fashion or another. And those are the bits of information as we unravel this great mystery of these dossiers, those are the little bits of information that we have out there. Now, the House Intelligence Committee and others who are investigating this, like Senator Grassley, we don't want to take away from Senator Grassley because yeah. Senator Grassley's <clears throat> letter and his exposure of Christopher Steele and asking for everybody's mm -hmm. communications. If you look at Senator Grassley's letter, he has asked the DOJ for all the communications of Cody Shear, of Sidney Blumenthal, wow. of Christopher Steele. Those are little pieces of this puzzle that we're putting together. And as we've seen, um, they're kicking and screaming. They don't want this information out into the public. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they were involved in subversively yeah. using this dossier to leak so, information. Sarah, looks sounds like what you're saying is that it's maybe we're going to go talk about not the Russians, but all the collusion happening in these investigations. Yeah, on the yeah, Sarah. sure. I'm not, right. I don't have another question. You answered all of them, so thank you. All right. <laughs> Thanks. All right, the Marines are doing something they haven't done in 30 years. They're going to run a Super Bowl ad. Their goal, get younger fans. The head of Recruiting Command joins us live to talk about that next. The overburdened system blamed for thousands of canceled operations due to an increase in seasonal illnesses combined with staffing shortages. And at least nine states now considering new laws requiring residents to buy health insurance. The proposal coming less than two months after Republicans voted to repeal the individual mandate in Obama-backed Affordable, Obama Affordable Care Act. Uh, some of those states include Maryland, California, and New Jersey. That is according to the Wall Street Journal. Well, for the first time in 30 years, the U.S. Marines will run a Super Bowl ad with one goal in mind, recruit and inspire young fans. It's not just the ships, the armor, or aircraft. It's the will to fight and determination to win found inside every Marine. Battles won. Joining us now is Commanding General for the Marine Corps Recruiting Command, Major General Paul Kennedy. Welcome to Fox and Friends. Hey, good, good morning. morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Quick question for you. That, that ad looks like a movie. Who are you trying to recruit um, with an ad like that? We're trying to have a conversation with uh, young people that <clears throat> are seeking uh, challenges in life. And what you're seeing is the culmination of an uh, ad campaign that appeals to um, men and women across this country that have uh, they fought through battles throughout their high school careers and they seek to further that uh, by joining the service, serving their country. Looking at the calendar, I understand that February through May is a really tough time to recruit. Why is that? Well, typically when a young person uh, becomes a senior in high school, they're eligible to enlist in one of the services. And so most of those contracts get written in the uh, summer months and into the first few months of the, of the school year, of the new school year. So by the time 
uh, February rolls around, you've probably written most of those kids. You've signed them up for service. And now what we're doing is mostly writing kids that um, have graduated high school um, or seeking something uh, else in their life. And it just it's a little bit tougher in, in those months. And, and tell us, I mean, everyone gets around the table, gets around the TV set gets around their iPhone now to watch the big game. Uh, what do you, what message do you want to send to Americans when we still have so many troops in harm's way all around the world? It's something more. Look, young people today are faced with uh, a multitude of uh, pressures, uh, the, the, the battle that they fight just getting through high school, staying out of trouble, mm -hmm. getting good grades. They might be working a job to help support their family. Uh, by the time they're finished, they may want to continue uh, to seek those challenges. And so 38,000 young people signed up last year to join the Marine Corps and that, for that very purpose. Well, I was just going to say, you've chose, you're saving the Marine Corps a lot of money by doing this online and not an actual television ad. Um, you called this, uh, these young people cord cutters. What do you mean by that? Well, increasingly, young people are getting their news and inf uh, information and entertainment from uh, means other than television, broadcast television. So they're getting it on handheld devices and on tablets. Um, they're watching it when they want to watch it. And so we thought it was smart and it was effective, cost effective, uh, to reach out during the Super Bowl this year uh, to about 20 million people that mostly, mostly younger people under 30 uh, that will take in um, our ad and our message. We're going to have a conversation with them tonight. Well... General, Major General Paul Kennedy, we appreciate your service. We thank you for that. All the men and women serving with you, and we hope that you uh, bring in a few good men and women uh, after the Super Bowl ad. Semper Fi. <laughs> thank you for thank your you, support. Sir. <laughs> Still ahead. President his patriots. Now we're going to toss on off. We didn't Hegseth. ask him to be fair. We, didn't we did not. Uh, Pete Hegseth and Eagles super fan Kelly and Conway. Guys, take it away. Boy, that's right. Thanks for sending it to us. You are exactly right. We, we just came into the uh, Eagles fight song, Fly, Eagles, Fly, which I know you love. Thanks so much for being here. Kelly and Conway, come here at the Brett. ticker tape parade later on in Philly this week. So that's a prediction. That's a prediction. Well, do you have a score prediction for tonight? No, just that the Eagles will score more points than the Patriots. Yes, they will. You know, we're, we're setting a record now, too. I think this is the coldest interview with the counselors of the president ever. Uh, I can confirm that that is true. <laughs> <laughs> and probably the first or second one in the Eagles gear. But we're really excited. It's a great day here with my husband and our two older children. And uh, the last time the Eagles were in a Super Bowl was against the Patriots. And our twins who are now 13 were three months old. So it's fun to bring them back. We hope for a different result this time. I know you hope for a different result. It's, have you ever been inside the stadium back? I have not. I know it's beautiful. And we watched that incredible photo finish of the Vikings game when they made it to the NFC Championship. Uh, it look, looked like a great stadium. I think we'll appreciate it when we're inside the stadium that much more. But we're looking for a big win today. It'll be a 90-degree change. It's negative 20 out here. It'll be 72 in there. So That's you'll be one way of looking at it. <laughs> Well, hey, so we got to get to some politics of the day as well. Um, obviously, Devin Nunes' committee releasing the memo, which so many people wanted to see. First of all, your reaction to the contents of that four-page memo and what it says about what was happening at the DOJ and the FBI. Well, the president has always called for transparency and accountability, Pete. That's what he's believed all along. Those who have been talking about collusion, collusion, collusion with no result for over a year should really appreciate the process of transparency and accountability even when it hits a little close to home. In this case, uh, I believe that Mr. McCabe testified that without that dossier, there would be no FISA warrant. And people are realizing too that dossier is just a fancy French word for a load of junk. Uh, and But the president is absolutely right, and I think tweeted again yesterday what he has said all along, which is this is just a hoax. We were promised collusion. They're moving on to other charges. But you know, in my position, I'm not the president's personal attorney. I would refer most of your questions to them, but in terms of releasing the memo, people were screaming about national security concerns and the whole world's gonna fall apart. I think people are just afraid that they look really bad. There are some personal relationships in there, some marital relationships, who's working at Fusion GPS, which took the Democratic money to fund the report. Christopher Steele uh, has admitted that he was desperate to make sure Donald Trump didn't get elected. So people should at least see that. They should see the bias for what it is. Tell me, talk to me more about that reaction from Democrats, the so-called mainstream media, saying that there are national, implication, national security implications to this release. 
Uh, how disingenuous do you do you find it disingenuous? Uh, why why won't they look at it as a possible exposure of the fact that there maybe there was bias atop these? Agents? I find it to be hyperbolic and very hypocritical because again they've been just charging forward for over a one year now, promising collusion, promising uh, a change in the election results, a nullification of a democratically elected president. That's just not happening. And I know that I know they're still trying to get over an election result that they neither expected nor wanted, but that's too bad. And this whole idea that that we're only supposed to investigate one piece and not the other is, is really wrong. And I hear these people saying that this is unprecedented and you're really hurting the relationship with the DOJ and the FBI. The president's made very clear, and I'll say it again, yet again, he respects the rank and file and the great hard work that these men and women do every single day as part of the FBI and those in the DOJ as well. But that doesn't mean that a couple of the bad apples out there who were just starting to see uh, had nefarious intentions and were desperate to try to uh, desperate to try to at least affect the outcome or after President Trump was elected yeah. to to mess with mess with him during transition. Well, we're hearing more will come out and it could come out additional memos. And when they do, we'll ask you about that as well. But we're- I support that as well. In other words, if the shift memo is gonna come forward, then go ahead. Sure. Uh, you know, we're, like I said, we're for transparency and accountability, but look, you can't argue this, not under oath through the cable TV wars. And that's what's happening. People are going on and saying things that are simply not true, hoping that they will come true. Well, this president sparked a national debate when he talked about kneelers. We're here at the NFL. There's no way to sort of scoot around it. Uh, it was a tough year for the NFL, for those who believe you should stand for the national anthem. A big national debate. Uh, what's your takeaway? You know, you're, you're going to cheer for your team in the Super Bowl today, but the, the NFL learned a lot of lessons this year. What's your takeaway from the stance the president took about standing for the anthem? The president is like any other American citizen. He can stand up for the flag and express that. He's got a big megaphone, of course. In my house, and I think in many households across this country, we say you take a knee for the Lord and you stand for the flag. It's a very simple calculation. I think that we don't have any kneelers today. We'll see what happens. Um, I actually thought my Philadelphia Eagles handled it well from the very beginning. They just had a humongous, humongous field-wide flag. And uh, a, a wonderful man singing the national anthem many times, including the FNC champion, NFC championship, African American, mm -hmm. a veteran, and I think that that was very, <clears throat> very uplifting to those who love the flag and believe in it. But um, also, I think when you look at the Grammys, the Emmys, all the ratings are down because people look at sports, they look at entertainment, they look at these award shows as an escape. They don't turn it on for politics. Yeah. And they don't want to hear negative, negative, negative necessarily all day long. I know it's easy to take a cheap shot, but to what end? It's it's not, it's it's not. Uh, it doesn't really fit with these award shows and the themes they're supposed to have. So I think here people are all about the great tradition of the Super Bowl. Yep. It ends up being a worldwide event. Uh, lots of great fans out there. Eagles fans are excited. Ran into some Patriots fans, of course. But it should be a great game, and people should realize this is one of the greatest American traditions and enjoy themselves, eat a little bit too much tonight, and uh, cheer the big green on to victory. We heard that. You know, just keep the politics out of it is what we heard time and time again. Well, guys, I'm going to toss it back to you, but let me say, Kellyanne Conway can play in the cold. Seriously. Yeah, she really can. I mean, she it's looks less freezing cold. out here. Summer, I am, I'm definitely the summer parent at home, but I thought I would do this uh, on a special day. Absolute champion. Thank you. We got to toss it back to New York. Thanks, Kelly. I appreciate it. Back to you All guys. Right. Great appreciate interview. Appreciate it. Yep. Good stuff. Turning now to your headlines. Terrifying moments caught on a dash cam as a man lunges off his car, attacking a police officer with a knife. Stop! Get out now! Stay right there! Stop! Or I'll shoot you! Oh, the suspect, Brett Bush, leading the Georgia officer on a high-speed chase after attempting to pull him over for speeding. The 28-year-old crashing into a Georgia driveway before being shot and killed by the unidentified officer. The cop, who's also a Marine veteran, is not injured. An elementary school canceling its father-daughter dance due to new gender rules. Parents and students are furious with the Staten Island, New York school, citing a state mandate to eliminate gender-based activities. A school official telling the New York Post, quote, father-daughter dances inherently leave people out, not just because of trans transgender status, just life in general. These can be really uncomfortable and triggering events. The school's PTA apparently planning to reschedule the dance for kids and caregivers of any gender for March 2nd. 
thousands of dollars worth of jewelry stolen from the pregnant fiance of actor John Stamos on the eve of their wedding. Stamos and actress Caitlin McHugh were not in their upscale Beverly Hills hotel room during the Friday night heist. The pieces were reportedly on loan. No suspects have been identified. The wedding went on as planned. The Hollywood couple tying the knot. Have Saturday. mercy. Have mercy, beautiful couple. And today is World Cancer Day, raising awareness of the global fight against this disease. It also honors survivors and advances in treatments being made every single day. Nearly 9 million people die from cancer worldwide every year. The theme of today is We Can, I Can. The campaign encourages everyone to do their part to help end the disease. This is a look at all of the cancer fighting events happening around the world right now, wow. including fundraisers and screenings. And those are your headlines, guys. Great cause. Beautiful. That's awesome. All right. Meanwhile, the stock market preparing for another big week. The Dow plunged 600 points on Friday. What can we expect at the opening bell? No one breaks it down better. Maria Bartiroma here next. Plus, we're just hours away from kickoff, and so we've got some last-minute menu ideas for your Super Bowl party. Oh. All that coming up when Fox & Friends on a Sunday returns. Good to, see you. Good to see you. So the question is, we saw this sell off in the market, um, but you say it's for all the good reasons. It is. I mean, look, there's still broad support for this market because the impact of the tax plan hasn't really been felt entirely yet. Right now, it's just anticipation. We also haven't seen the, the full impact of the regulatory rollback. So there's a real uh, support for this market because the underlying fundamentals are very strong. Uh, Friday, we got a jobs number out, 200,000 jobs created in the month of January. We also got the Atlanta Federal Reserve coming out with a new prediction on economic growth. They've got a, a GDP number for the first quarter, which we're in right now, of 5.4%. That's very strong. Are you Those actually trying to make numbers. the case that crumbs will equal some real bread for people? <laughs> oh, my God. 100%. This tax plan is going far, and it's going deep. There's a really big impact. It's going to be felt from on individuals as well as corporations, and that will continue to help economic growth. So I think that, you know, markets don't go up in a straight line forever. We've had an incredible performance, $8 trillion in market value since the election. Of course, you are going to see markets go up and down. And now that we're talking about a different scenario. We have a new conversation happening right now. It's about higher wages and it's about inflation. These are the things that happen with a stronger economy. Right. That wage number on Friday was very strong, up 2.9% year over year. We're finally seeing individual wages go up and that, that's why markets have been uh, nervous. But I think it can be a little bit confusing to the average American who doesn't necessarily fully understand economics why we can have an amazing jobs growth number and then we see a market tank basically almost 700 points. Explain how it all comes back to interest rates. Yeah, because you know when, when you're investing, you have to make a decision. Do I want to take on a little more risk and look for a higher return and go into the stock market? Or do I want to stay